Now you can understand why the head of the Yonkers Raceway would argue for expanding casino gambling. Uh, they obviously would make some money out of the deal. The state uh, would get huge revenues. Schools would get more money. Senator Ball, where do you stand on the idea of legalizing full Las Vegas style gambling? You know, I think that uh, it's certainly a, a good opportunity. I think that when we move forward, we've got to make sure that, that there are certain protections in there. We don't need a casino on every street corner throughout the state of New York, right? So we need to have certain protections. Also, in this instance, you have um, an organization, large employer. They've already went through the, the hassle. They, you know, they should be grandfathered in and be protected. So they're, they don't have unfair competition at, as well. But um, I, don't, I, I certainly don't buy it that it's going to solve all the problems in, in New York State, but I also think it's ridiculous that we're losing business to other states and, and beyond. Uh, just, I mean, look, people cross the border every day. So we need to allow these opportunities in New York, make sure it's properly regulated, and the increase in, in the economic activity will certainly be a shot in the arm at the right time. So if the right bill does come up for a vote sure. this year, you would likely vote yes. yes. What about you, Senator right, Carlucci? I, I really echo that. I mean, the reality is that you can go into any convenience store now and, and gamble away your whole week's paycheck in a matter of minutes. Um, what the plan is right now and the projections, we're talking about just nine racinos throughout the state of New York, so we're really well controlled, which is important. At the same time, they're talking about an economic uh, output of $3.3 billion is the projection. What that means is a lockbox on education of an increase of about $300 million a year. Uh, so this is really important that we get this done. Uh, we're not talking about a huge impact into the, you know, or a devastation to the quality of life of people's, uh, people in our community. We're talking about increased revenue. The other important thing that we have to address is with these uh, added table games, uh, the amount of employees that will be added, we need to make sure there's project protections for them so that we have good paying jobs for the people that will be uh, added to the, to the work, wall, uh, work roles in New York State. So I think those are the important things that we've got to focus on is say when this is done that it's well controlled, uh, that the people that are employed at these facilities have protections, uh, they have the right to organize and, and things like that so they have good paying jobs and they can live a great quality of life. And, and you're telling me something I didn't necessarily know, but this doesn't mean a, a casino in Manhattan and a casino on Long Island and a casino in Rockland and a casino in Putnam. It means expanding the current racetrack-based casino system, That's correct? what we're talking about right now. That's right. So until there's a full-blown uh, change to the, the New York State Constitution, uh, you wouldn't have that full-blown casino uh, gambling all over the place. What we're talking about right now is to help uh, the places like Empire Raceway or uh, uh, um, all these other racinos around the state to make sure that they can thrive. And, and that's what we're talking about. And having it controlled, uh, we can have that huge economic output into our, to our state. And even to do that, you have to pass a constitutional amendment, which is two consecutive legislatures and a public referendum that people have to vote on this, correct? No, Brian, that also, it, it opens up another process, which is that there's an issue with, with the lockboxing of lottery dollars. We, you know, we've been told many times about those dollars going towards education, and people have, have questioned that. And I think in this process, we have the opportunity to, to revisit that and make sure that those dollars are specifically set aside for education funding in a way that they, they haven't been because of a commingling in, in, the, in the general funds. But you're right, it's a, it's, a, it's a lengthy process, but one that you know we can get started. And as, it's my understanding that once, I mean, we're, we're almost done with this session, I mean, in a little bit, and uh, we'll be into next year pretty quickly and could immediately you know, follow up with two consecutive legislative votes. And, and, what, the, and, and then it could be on the ballot for the people in the fall of 2013, I think, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. And one of the things that we need to address, too, when we talk about that lockbox for education, 60% uh, of the payouts of the lottery uh, go to winnings. And one of the things, if we can adjust to say, look, maybe a $100 million uh, lottery jackpot, if we could shrink that by 10% and put that into education, uh, that would be a huge benefit to our public schools. So if we, right now, we paid out $4 billion last year in lotto winnings. Uh, if we change it, that's a 60% payout. If we change it just to 50%, we'd have an extra $400 million uh, for education in New York State. And that's much needed money right now. Then uh, I'm not buying any more tickets. That's, <laughs> it. <laughs> that's right. And that's why I say, okay, you win 40, you can win 50, billion, 50 million or you win 46 million. You know, you're I, I don't you're know if doing pretty good one way or the other. That's right. All I'm right. sure I'll get some pushback on that, but I think if we move in that direction to what it's really supposed to go towards, the whole premise we were sold on right. the lotto was it's going to help education. We want to see it doing that.
every local school district is struggling now, especially with the two yeah. percent tax cap. Uh, let me ask you about that because there's a lot of other issues I want to get to. What's your take on the two percent property tax cap that came without what they call <coughs> mandate relief? School districts, uh, local municipalities, counties are all struggling right now. There's no question. And, and one of the important things is we've got to make sure we have a sustainable future in New York State. And under the, the previous system that we have where you just keep increasing property taxes 5, 6, 7 percent a year, it's unsustainable. It's unsustainable for everyone. The important thing is that we work together to figure out how can we make government uh, municipalities, villages, school districts more affordable and produce a quality product because we want to provide the best education possible to our kids. But if we can't afford to live here, then what's the purpose? And, and that's what we've got to really drill down to. So I think the property tax cap was an important step and it's doing the right thing by making sure we're living in a budget. At the same part, we've got to do our part and, and deliver mandate relief. And we've worked in a bipartisan approach to do that. And we've been putting forth bills. The idea is what is the mandate relief that we can get past that will <clears throat> give the most relief to our school districts. And I really believe we've got to give them the tools so they can make the decisions to cut costs and make things more efficient. And some of those things are consolidating health care costs, so pool employees under one health care plan. Uh, BOCES, we've got a huge opportunity. Uh, Greg's district borders Connecticut, my district borders New Jersey. And with the BOCES system, if we can allow students to use our services, so pay tuition, uh, so we can keep classes open and generate revenue from that, uh, there's some opportunities to make some money there and keep some of the classes full so we can have the type of programs that we want. Pension reform is another huge deal. The, the, the costs of ballooning pensions are just killing local municipalities and school districts. Where do you stand on all that and the tax cap? You know, the, the governor has made uh, pension reform a, a top priority, and I, I think that you're going to see a, a, a push uh, to provide that in the form of unfunded mandate relief. The tax cap itself, you know, folks are, we know, are, are really struggling. Um, those double-digit tax increases that have happened compounded annually didn't happen overnight and we're not going to get out of this mess overnight but the reality is that tax cap is forcing a couple things number one it's forcing municipalities and school districts to make the tough decisions that small business owners and family people sitting around like my blue-collar family sitting around a kitchen table have been making for a long time the other thing it's doing is forcing a real conversation about unfunded mandate relief I never thought that people come up to me at the gym and say uh, Greg you gotta do something about unfunded mandate relief that's like my you know I was like my nephew saying hey what's up what about tort reform that just doesn't happen <laughs> <laughs> but that is happening, and I think that between uh, the pension reform push, my opinion, promises made need to be promises kept. There are a lot of blue-collar families out there. My mom, I don't think she ever made more than $29,000 a year. She's a and teacher she, or a nurse? She, she worked at Harlem Valley Psychiatric uh -huh. Center, uh, and uh, you know, never graduated from, from high school, went right to work, and uh, she would work overtime. That's how she you know, put clothes on our backs. It's not blue collar people like that, it's the corruption in the system that needs to be weeded out. Um, but, but that said, uh, on unfunded mandate relief, I believe that because of the tax cap, Albany is now hearing it ring off the hook, you better do something. And I, I believe that we're going to get it done. You know, we have the Mandate Relief Council, there's supposed to be an up or down vote. We have a, over 150, it's actually 151 proposals. Some are small and some are big uh, to have an up or down vote and begin to give real unfunded mandate relief uh, and, and the Medicaid takeover as well, right. um, at least through a phase out, will help the counties and, and the local governments. There is another issue uh, that came, kind of came to a head this week, and that is about redistricting. There are these kind of partisan lines being drawn, and Senator Carlucci, you are very much involved in this because suddenly your Rockland and Orange County district may hop the Hudson River and take over uh, Ossining, the town and village of Ossining. Three or four new proposals came out this week. Can you give our viewers an update on where redistricting stands and what the heck is going to happen? Well, the redistricting process is a crazy process in New York State, and it's something that I think needs major reform. Uh, I, for one, have supported a constitutional amendment for independent redistricting. I mean, you can see these maps. Uh, they don't make sense. Uh, and what we need to do is make sure that the communities are as contiguous as possible. Uh, we need an independent commission to draw these lines, and I think it's something that we need to push forward because it's not in the best interest of our communities if you have politicians drawing these lines. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have much of a say in the way these lines would be drawn um, and I'm going to work to whatever the district winds up being I'm going to serve them to the best of my ability 
Uh, one of the problems with the district I represent is that we've grown uh, the most out of any other district in the state of New York. Uh, so the district I represent is the largest district in the state, so we knew some of the population would have to be lost. But it, it really stinks because I've worked hard with so many people throughout the community and you develop strong relationships and you get passionate about these issues. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how it plays out and we need to push for independent redistricting. Is this all going to wind up in court and some judge is going to say do this or, or do we go back? H how's it going to play out? I mean, think? quite honestly, a lot of this is both ahead of both of our pay grades. I actually requested to get part of Austin, Texas and redistricting <laughs> it didn't happen. Tells you how much pull that I, I have. Um, it would be nice to have truly nonpartisan redistricting but this is this is what happens the question is you have a, a nonpartisan panel to do redistricting who appoints the people on that nonpartisan panel and at the end of the day we have a process now where you have a, a, a Republican majority in the Senate you have a Democratic majority in the Assembly and we have a Democratic governor this governor uh, can serve as the checks and balances in a veto or otherwise to work with those legislative leaders um, and I think that that's what's going to happen he's going to continue to provide that leadership does it all wind up in court do you think Senator Carlucci uh, I, I think that's the way it's going the governor said he's going to veto it you hear different things all the time uh, we're going to see what happens all right, gentlemen, thank you very much. We are out of time. State Senator uh, David Carlucci and State Senator Greg Ball, you, appreciate your sharing. I, I could have asked you about five or six other topics, and maybe we'll have you back to do that another day. Love to. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. That's all the time we have for this edition of News 12's Newsmakers. Thank you for making us a part of your weekend. I'm Brian Connie Bear. More local news coming up next.